once again. It's good to see everyone. Today from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, our speaker is Bill Martin. Have you ever wondered about star triangle diagrams? Do you ask yourselves what scaffolds are? The answer, my friends, is right around the corner. So let's not give it up for Bill. Thank you very much, Sophia. That's very, very kind of you. So, so thanks, thanks to everyone for coming. And um, I hope that uh, you find something interesting. Um, Sophia has done a great, great job running this seminar, um, and uh, and we're all really, really delighted with what you what, what you've been doing this year. So, um, so I want to talk to you about these tensors, and these are not my idea. These ideas go back. Um, to uh, Neumeyer, to Williger, uh, you'll see stuff um, in Suzuki's paper. But um, I'll start by talking about something I know nothing about. And, and hopefully at some point in the talk, I, I'll be talking about something I know something about. So, um, so let me see how to um, go here. So um, Yves Colin de Verdier introduced uh, circular planar graphs. And I usually get to this topic at the end of my talk. And so I thought I would start with this instead of putting it at the end. So a circular planar graph is a planar graph um, embedded in the disk. And I'm going to call the vertices of this graph nodes because I'm going to use another, another uh, word, an, an, another meaning of vertices. So it's the circular planar graph is embedded in the disk. And there are certain boundary nodes, which I'm going to call root nodes. And they live on the boundary of the disk. And all the other nodes in, are in the interior. OK, so here are a couple of circular planar graphs with um, two or three root nodes. Um, now I have to make sure that I, I can. So <clears throat> something happened here. Hold on. It's, uh, it just fast forwarded through a whole bunch of uh, slides. So, um, so Colin de Verdier uh, introduced these local moves on circular planar graphs. So one thing you can do, you see these, um, here's a vertex of degree one. And you can delete vertices of degree one that aren't root nodes. So as long as, the, as long as that node is hollow, not red, you can delete that. And you can also delete loops. So you can delete degree one nodes. Also here are two parallel edges. And you can delete parallel, you can replace two parallel edges by a single edge. Another move that uh, de Verdier had, uh, Colin de Verdier, I should say, um, is that you can replace any triangle by a star. So if you have three edges uh, in forming a triangle, you can put a new node in and replace those three edges by three edges going to that new node. Another thing you can do is take two edges that are in series, and you can replace them by a single edge. And of course, you can go from triangles, uh, from stars back to triangles. So these are the moves. You can, you can suppress nodes of degree one, so you can remove loops, you can do series and parallel reductions or expansions. And then we have this delta y, or this star triangle relation, where you can replace triangles by stars and stars by triangles. So this is not, um, th this is as much pretty much as I want to say about this. But the literature, this, this is not the, the, um, the, the end of the story. Colin de Verdier introduced this in this, this paper in 1992 on um, uh, planar electrical networks part one, and then with uh, Isidore Gittler, who was in my classes at Waterloo together with me, and Dirk Vertigan, they uh, wrote a second paper. And, um, and, and uh, this paper, Planar Electric Networks, part two, talked about this response matrix. I'll mention this very briefly. So on the red nodes at the boundary, you're given voltages. And then the question is, can you recover from the voltages? Can you recover the, the, the um, conductances or resistances on the edges inside the graph? Or can you even recover the graph? In some cases, you can even recover the graph. And there's this very important matrix called the response matrix, which encodes this map um, from, from one set of voltages to another set of voltages. And uh, you get re unique recovery of the, of the um, uh, res resistances if the graph is critical, or sort of reduced in, in, in a critical sense. 
And uh, one thing that's really interesting is that um, uh, Thomas Lamb and, and um, Pavlo Pililovsky uh, have uh, attached Lie algebras to these, um, these configurations. And, uh, and there's an idea of electrical Lie algebra. So there's a lot going on here. But all I want to do is just use that idea of a circular planar graph. And I want you to look throughout the talk for a circular planar dual. So here's the idea of the circular planar dual. It's very similar to constructing the planar dual of a graph. So I put, here's a face right here on the left. And I put a node in that spot representing that face. And for each of the three edges incident to that face, I put three edges. If they're directed edges, I'll rotate everything 90 degrees. Um, I should probably exit my email program before we get too many, um, before we get too many of these things. Do you still see the, 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 um, the slides here? Okay, now one thing that happens in the dual is that um, the, the, uh, the boundary nodes, uh, the, the boundary nodes of the dual object are the segments between boundary nodes of the original object. So in some sense, you could insert a vertex at degree infin a, a, a vertex at infinity that's attached to all the boundary nodes, take the planar dual, and then you would delete the edges joining the new boundary nodes. So this planar dual uh, takes circular planar graphs with m root nodes and turns them into circular planar graphs with m root nodes. Okay, so, so I hope that you'll see that coming up in the talk here and there. Okay, so now I want to get into scaffolds and it's a horrible definition. So I want you to believe, that's my main goal of the talk, is to get you to believe that this is an intuitive and useful concept. Okay, so we're going to be taking graphs and we put weights on the edges, which are matrices, okay? So the edge weights here are matrices. And if I have a red node and a matrix on a loop here, then that, that denotes the first order tensor, which is the diagonal of that matrix. If I hollow it out and I sum over the diagonal, I get the trace. We're going to identify the vector space with its dual space so that the matrices are just uh, second order tensors and they'll be represented by diagrams like this with two red nodes. If I want to sum up all the entries in the matrix, I replace the red nodes by hollow nodes. If I want to multiply the matrix by the all ones vector, I'll make one node hollow, depending on whether I want the all ones vector on the left or the right. Matrix, in the definition on the next page, matrix multiplication just simply becomes a series reduction. And entry-wise multiplication just becomes parallel reduction. Okay, so, the, so these are properties of the definition on the next page, and we'll come back and look at these, but I, I have to get you to the definition now. So here's the definition. So we have a finite non-empty set, X, and all of our matrices have rows and columns indexed by X, okay? You can think of these as spins if you, if you uh, come from the spin model world. And now we have a digraph, nodes V of G and arcs or edges E of G. These are going to be directed edges in some cases. And we have an ordered subset, or it could be that some of these things are equal, but let's just say we have an ordered subset for today of root nodes. Some subset of the nodes are root nodes. And we have a matrix W of E attached to every edge E. And the scaffold is this quantity. We're given the, di the diagram G, we're given the roots, we'll call that a rooted diagram, and we're given the edge weights, which are matrices, and we sum over all functions from the nodes to our set X, which indexes the rows and columns of our edge weights, and we take the product, this just looks just like a partition function here, we take the product over all edge weights of the entry in row phi of A, column phi of B, over all edges. And then we record some of the information about where, some, where the root nodes go. And these are um, standard basis vectors. Phi of R1 hat is the standard basis vector in direction, R, in, in direction phi of R1. So for our vector space V, which is a set of all complex valued functions on X, is going to have a standard basis X1 hat, X2 hat, and so on, one for each element of X. So if there are m root nodes, we say that this is a scaffold of order m, because it's an 
nth order ten tensor here. Okay, so let's um, let's go back and just look at one example in the previous slide. So suppose G has a single node and it's red, it's a root node, and the weight is some matrix M. Now we take the sum over all functions from that one vertex, that one node, to our rows and columns, and we take that matrix M and we take the entry in row phi of A, column phi of A, because there's only one node. And so that right here is exactly the sum over all the rows of the matrix, the diagonal entry times the standard basis vector, which is exactly the diagonal of the matrix. And if that node was not a root node, then I would sum up all those diagonal entries, but I wouldn't record where they came from. And so that would just be a scalar, okay? So this right here uh, is the definition, which I think is important. And um, I know that it's horrible and hard, hard to memorize, but um, it's going to intuitively make sense. Everything that I wrote on the previous slide is a consequence of this definition. The series reduction is matrix multiplication, parallel reduction is entrywise multiplication. So why is it a new, a new piece of terminology? These have been called star triangle diagrams. Paul Terwilliger has uh, these in his papers and he attributes this to Arnold Neumeyer. Um, I thought that scaffolds um, might be a reasonable, uh, reasonable term for these things because we're building up from the second order tensors of matrices, we can build up higher order tensors on top of these things, but all of the edges are built out of matrices from let's say a Bose-Mesner algebra, for example. And um, I, I looked through the literature and I found that the term scaffold was not being used um, in, in our area, so it didn't seem to create uh, contradictions or, or confusion. Okay, so one thing that happens since the coefficient of each elementary tensor is a product over edges of edge weights of entries, if all the entries on any particular edge, if all the entries are one, that is the all ones matrix, J is the all ones matrix, if all the edge weights are one, um, no matter which elements these two nodes get mapped to, then that just vanishes out of the product. Let's go back to that product. If one of those uh, WV is just the all ones matrix, then that uh, becomes superfluous in the product. So the all ones matrix can be inserted or deleted wherever we like, and it doesn't change the value of this tensor. On the other hand, the identity matrix means if I put an identity matrix uh, on, on an edge, then the only functions phi, which give me a non-zero contribution are functions phi, which map that node A and that node B to the same element. And so the only, um, the only functions phi that, uh, that give a non-zero contribution to this sum are the ones where these two nodes go to the same place, so I may as well identify them. Okay, so, so replacing, um, and all ones weighted edge by nothing, or deleting it, I should say, uh, doesn't change the value of this tensor. And contracting an edge that's weighted with the identity doesn't change the tensor. Okay, so here's some technicality. So um, we're using this isomorphism. I know I throw complex numbers out front. Um, I'm using the isomorphism that uh, V is isomorphic to the complex numbers tensor V. Um, we fix this basis, the standard basis, x hat for all elements x vertices in our in our set x uh, for this vector space v of functions and that gives us this canonical isomorphism between v and v dual and so instead of thinking of it as a, a matrix as an element of v dual tensor v we're going to simplify everything and just treat it as, as an element of v tensor v and so the elements of v tensor v are just going to be identified with matrices throughout this talk secondly whenever i i just draw a picture of the graph, the, the, the diagram with its roots and its edge weights pictorially. When I, when I draw that data, I mean exactly that tensor. Okay, so I'm going to identify the pictorial description with the tensor. If I have identities such as the series, series parallel reductions and so on with all the endpoints red nodes, then I, I assure you with the technical lemma that that substitution, any equation of that sort can be, 
can be implemented on larger diagrams and the, the identity is still true on larger diagrams. You can make these local moves. Um, if you have, uh, if you're in a situation where all your matrices are symmetric, so for example, if you're in a uh, closed semester algebra of a symmetric association scheme or in the adjacency algebra of a graph, all your matrices are symmetric and so it doesn't matter which direction the edges are. So you can ignore the directions on edges. Or if I'm just looking at the diagram and thinking about different scaffolds that can occur on that diagram with the edge weights inside some vector space. If the vector space is closed under the transpose operation, then I can ignore edges on the diagram. Uh, vertices of degree one, uh, we, we can get rid of these as long as the matrices that we're working with have constant row sum. So we can suppress vertices of degree one. We can also suppress loops. If the if the vertices have, if the edge weights have constant diagonal, so these things have shown up in combinatorics in various places. So if you look at um, uh, uh, Lobos's book on on large networks, uh, you'll see these diagrams representing something slightly different. So here, if the edge weights are just the always the adjacency matrix of a graph and I have no red nodes at all, no roots at all, then this quantity right here is a scalar. And that scalar counts homomorphisms. So it just counts the homomorphisms from this diagram into our graph, which has adjacency matrix A. And so here we count labeled triangles. Uh, Lobos uses something slightly different. He has, a, he has pictures like this in his book that are very similar, but he's scaling by a cardinality of x to the number of nodes in the diagram so that his uh, homomorphism density is the probability that a randomly selected function from the, from the diagram into your graph, the probability that that's a homomorphism, what fraction of those things are homomorphisms. And uh, these homomorphism densities play a, a crucial role in his uh, definition of a convergent sequence of graphs and in the theory of graphons. So this shows up there and then also it show, um, shows up in link diagrams, in fact, this only seemed natural to me when I realized that we'd already seen this in the partition functions that we see in, in uh, link invariants and in spin models. So we have knots or links such as uh, these here in this, in this slide, and we have these basic Reitermeister moves. And the fundamental theorem of Reitermeister is that two drawings represent the same link if and only if one can be transformed into the other by a finite sequence of these Reitermeister moves. So Reitermeister moves of type one, we have a little twist in a loop and we can untwist it or retwist it in the opposite direction. Type two, if the red string goes in front of the blue string, I can slide it down and, and get it away from that, the blue string, or I can slide it behind the blue string. And type three, if the red and blue, ver uh, red and blue strands form a crossing and the blue string, the red and black strands form a crossing and the blue strand is in front of that crossing, then that blue strand can be slid across, uh, across that crossing. And that represents the same diagram. So I think a lot of you know about these Reitermeister moves. And what happens is in order to build a link invariant, we attach a zeroth order scaffold, which of course has completely different terminology to each of these diagrams. And so each of these diagrams, we two color the faces and we take the, the gray faces and we put a node in, inside each of those faces and the edge weights are either a matrix W plus or a matrix W minus depending on how the crossing relates to the gray, the gray regions. And I'm not gonna go over the details. But the goal is to choose weights, W plus and W minus, so that no matter what diagram we have of the same knot, we're always going to get the same scalar. And so we need the weights to give us something that's invariant under the Reitermeister moves. And it turns out that um, we have this definition of a spin model. So this, this is from Francois Giger's paper, but I guess it's spin, spin models come from Vaughn Jones. Spin model is a triple, you have a, a finite set X of, vertice, of vertices or spins. And we have two matrices, W plus and W minus, whose rows and columns are indexed by X. And they have to satisfy the following conditions. W plus has constant diagonal alpha and constant row sum D, alpha, uh, D, D over alpha. And 
constant column sum d over alpha. The W minus has constant diagonal al alpha inverse, constant row sum d alpha, and constant column sum d alpha. The type two relation to be invariant under the type two Reitermeister moves, and I won't go into any of the details, I think you folks know it better than I do, <clears throat> is that the entrywise product of W plus and W minus transpose is the all ones matrix. And the matrix product of W plus and W minus is a constant times the identity matrix. The constant is the number of spins. And then the third one is something here, which looks a lot like our scaffold, um, something that falls into the scaffold uh, formalism here. It's the type three relation, the invariance under type three Reitermeister moves. And all I wanna do in this part of the talk is just show you that those, those identities exactly that you're looking at right now are exactly encoded in these scaffold identities. So the first one in the top left corner says the entrywise product of W plus and the identity is alpha times the identity. So that is W plus has constant diagonal equal to alpha. W minus entrywise product, the identity, is alpha inverse times the identity. So W minus has constant diagonal alpha inverse. This is the row sum of W plus and the column sum of W plus are both the alpha inverse. The row sum and column sum of W minus are, are this D alpha. The entrywise product of W plus and W minus transpose, you notice here that the arrow goes in the opposite direction to get the transpose, is the all ones matrix, which is the absence of an edge. And the matrix product of W plus and W minus is the number of spins times the identity. And then it turns out that the, the star triangle relation, this type three, um, type three condition is exactly encoded in the equality of these two scaffolds, that these two tensors have to be equal. And usually what you see is on what you have on the previous slide, instead of saying that the tensors have to be equal, you have this quantifier right here for every A, B, and C, which just says every coefficient, corresponding coefficients of those two tensors must be equal. So all we're really doing is just taking the quantifier away and replacing it with red dots. So these are the, um, the, the definition of a spin model in, in this language. Okay. So now I want to assume from now on that uh, my edge weights come from a coherent algebra. So I'm going to assume that my edge weights come from a vector subspace of the vector space of complex matrices. And I want that subspace to be closed under conjugate transpose operation, or it turns out that's equivalent to being closed under the transpose operation and the conjugate operation. It's closed under the matrix multiplication. It's closed under the entrywise multiplication and it contains the identity for entrywise multiplication J and the identity for matrix multiplication I. I'm mostly interested in the commutative case. So um, a commutative Bose-Messner algebra, I know that Professor Banai includes the non-commutative case here, but for me, a, a Bose-Messner algebra is a, co coher a coherent algebra, which is commutative. And we're going to let X uh, the, the rows and columns of all these matrices are indexed by this finite set X, and we'll call that the vertex set. So <clears throat> suppose we take a coherent algebra and we say, okay, what possible scaffolds can we get with, let's say, four red nodes and all of the edge weights inside that algebra? Well, it turns out that the, that that vector space spanned by all scaffolds with four red nodes and edge weights inside this algebra has dimension equal to the number of orbits of that algebra on ordered four tuples of vertices. In general, the space of all spanned by all the nth order scaffolds with edge weights in this algebra is equal to the number of orbits of the automorphism group of the algebra on m tuples. I don't know what happened there. And the basis elements are just these sums over the, over the orbits. Okay, so now we know the dimension of the space of all possible scaffolds um, with, with M root nodes. Oh, and I used R, I changed from M to R. So there's a typo right here, that, should, that R should be M. Apologize. So <clears throat> let me... Um, define an association scheme combinatorially, since I'm really much more interested in, in graph theory, I like to think of things gra graph theoretically instead of in terms of an algebra of matrices. 
So an association scheme is an ordered pair. We have a set of vertices and we have a partition of the ordered, ordered pairs of vertices into relations. We have relations R0 up to Rd. And every ordered pair is in exactly one of these relations. One of the relations is the identity relation. So we always call that R0 by convention. For each relation, I, Ri, it's transposed. That is where you swap all the, all, all the ordered pairs, first and second coordinates of the ordered pairs. That must also be a relation. In a symmetric association scheme, it's the same relation, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And then the fundamental definition, which makes the vector space in algebra, is that there exists these constants, P, I, J, K, called intersection numbers, such that given, um, given A and B, if I want to know how many Cs have the property that the arc A to C is in Ri and the arc from C to B is in Rj, that this only depends on I, J, and the relation that joins A and B, Rk, and not on the choice of A and B themselves. And then again, I, in my world, association schemes are commutative, so um, I require that Pijk equals Pjik. So for example, every finite group gives us an association scheme uh, from its conjugacy classes. So you take a finite group, such as the symmetric group S3, and for each conjugacy class, C alpha, you build a relation R alpha, where you join group element G to group element H if GH inverse belongs to that conjugacy class. So of course you have the trivial conjugacy class which gives you the identity relation and in, in a symmetric group of course the transpositions live in one conjugacy class so the identity is joined to the transpositions and the three cycles are in another conjugacy class. And so here we have one Cayley graph for each conjug conjugacy class. So one reasonable thing if you haven't seen an association scheme before is to think of it as this um, sort of center of the group algebra of a, of a finite group. So here, each of those graphs, black, blue, and green, has an adjacency matrix, black, blue, and green, and the vector space spanned by these matrices is closed under multiplication. So for any association scheme, we have two bases for the Bosemester algebra. We've got a basis of zero, one matrices. We can think of those as adjacency matrices of some graphs. So AI entrywise itself, AI entrywise squared is AI because the entries are all zero and one. And if I is not equal to J, then AI and AJ have no one in common because those relations RI and RJ were disjoint. And then that nice third condition in the definition of an association scheme tells us that AI times AJ is a linear combination of, of, of the elements from this set. There are also these, this set of matrices, it's a commutative semi-simple algebra, so these matrices are simultaneously diagonalizable. So if I take um, the projections onto the maximal common eigenspaces, I get uh, a, a second important basis. And these have the property that EI matrix product EJ is zero if I is not equal to J, and EI squared is EI. And then the entrywise product of EI and EJ is a linear combination of these, and these are called prime parameters, Q, I, J, K. So it turns out that it's quite easy to check that P, I, J, K is zero if and only if this tensor, this triangle tensor is zero. And it's a little bit harder to check, but there are several easy proofs um, that Q, I, J, K is zero if and only if this star tensor is zero. So the vanishing intersection numbers correspond to vanishing scaffolds, third order scaffolds, and the vanishing crime parameters also correspond to vanishing third order scaffolds, but they're stars and triangles. They're circular planar duals of one another. Those two diagrams are circular planar duals of one another. That second identity um, first showed up in the paper of Cameron Huttels and Seidel, and um, this is uh, where the people doing all kinds of magic with triple intersection numbers, this is where they get their, their fuel from, is from this identity, which gives them combinatorial information about things like strongly regular graphs. So in that paper, Cameron Huttels and Seidel studied um, locally strongly regular graphs. So <clears throat> they found out that a crime parameter Q111 is zero if and only if this tensor with all these edge weights or the adjacency matrix of the graph, the distance one matrix of the strongly regular graph, 
if that is a scalar multiple of this tensor right here. And we're going to generalize that in a couple of minutes, but I want to um, first talk about inner products. So if you take your, your, your standard definition of inner products of tensors, so let's say vector u tensor w and vector x tensor vector y, the inner product of that is typically done component wise, the inner product of u with x and the inner product of w with y, and you just multiply those scalars. If you take that standard definition of the inner product of tensors, then what that corresponds to in scaffolds is you take the scaffolds, you, you have to have the, um, the, the root nodes aligned spatially. So we're going just to assume that they're, if they're in the same position in the two diagrams that those are the, let's say these two top ones are the first component in the tensors. And let's say the, the southwest ones are the second component and southeast ones are the third components. So you have to agree on some uh, ordering of, of the uh, root nodes then it turns out that that standard inner product just uh, amounts to taking corresponding root nodes and gluing them together and making everything hollow. So now I can put an identity matrix and of course that contracts and I get this quantity right here. So for example, um, I really thought that, um, that this quantity would be non-negative. Um, so here I have a Peterson graph and um, the idempotents E0, E1, and E2 uh, project onto eigenspaces with eigenvalue 3, 1, and minus 2, respectively. And even though every edge weight here is positive semi-definite, it turns out that this inner product is negative. I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, <clears throat> I'm interested in fixing the diagram. Let me check my time. Um, we, we, I should, I should finish, we started uh, late, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll finish on time. So given the diagram and the set of root nodes, so the rooted diagram, and if we're given a, a Bose-Mesner algebra or some interesting space, let's say the adjacency algebra of the graph for the edge weights, we'd like to look at the space spanned by all possible scaffolds that we can get by putting those edge weights on that diagram. So we fix the diagram and we try all possible edge weights and we look at that vector space. So we're gonna call that vector space W of the rooted diagram with edge weights in A. So this right here, WGRA, here's the rooted diagram and here's the algebra where we're allowed to send our edges. And um, we're gonna take the vector space of all the tensors we can obtain from that. So for example, if A is a coherent algebra, then we know that this is, <clears throat> that, 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 uh, that series reductions just correspond to multiplications in A, and, and A is closed under multiplication. Entry-wise uh, multiplication corresponds to parallel reduction, so we can always do parallel reductions and still stay inside A. The coherent algebra is closed under transpose, so when we reverse the direction of an edge, it doesn't change uh, it doesn't change uh, our, uh, the, the, uh, the set of matrices that we have available to us. So for a coherent algebra, our diagrams can be undirected and they may as well not have any uh, parallel edges and no edges in series. So um, for example, if, if uh, the, our diagram is the complete graph K2 and both of the vertices are, are roots, then uh, this is the way we're going to write that um, this right here, whoops, is, uh, is abbreviated as this um, diagram right here. This, this is the notation for this vector space. And of course, with only one edge, then all you really get is A under ident the identification that we had in, in the earlier slide. If there are two root nodes and G is connected with at most four edges, or in fact, even if G is a two terminal series parallel graph, then it turns out that you can't get outside the Bose-Mesner algebra. But there are planar two-terminal two graphs where you sometimes do get outside the Bose-Mesner algebra. So the Strokhandi graph is this beautiful, uh, strongly regular graph, 16 vertices uh, drawn on a torus with four four cycles that go around this way and four four cycles that go down through the, down through the hole in the middle. And there's four four cycles that go around sort of diagonally, this beautiful six regular graph. And for that graph, uh, this scaffold 
um, is, a, is a matrix, 16 by 16 matrix, but it's not in the Bose-Messner algebra. Uh, sorry, and, and, and I didn't tell you what the edge weights were. For that particular um, scaffold I'm talking about, all the edge weights are equal to the adjacency matrix, and that matrix is not in the Bose-Messner algebra. So Paul Terwilliger, <clears throat> in this important paper in 1987 on characterization of P and Q polynomial association schemes, he essentially showed that the tensors with the AI, AJ, AK um, on the edges and the triangles, that these things are pairwise orthogonal. And of course, only the non-zero one should, um, uh, are non-zero, only when P, I, J, K is non-zero, is the tensor non-zero from before. So therefore, it turns out that this is an orthogonal basis for the space of all scaffolds you can build on a triangle. And if I take all of the tensors of this form where Q, I, J, K is positive, then we get an orthogonal basis for this space of tensors. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to fudge here on my definition of a rooted minor. Uh, you know that if you want very, very precise definitions of minors in, in, in graphs, it can, it can take a while. But in, when I take a graph minor, I allow deletion and contraction of edges. But now we want a rooted minor. So in a rooted minor, when I delete and contract edges, sometimes vertices go away, but I'm not allowed to make the root vertices go away. So the red vertices must stay. So I want to take H as a rooted minor of G means that when I take H as a minor of G, the roots of G map bijectively to the roots of H. Okay, so we're taking graph minors and we're requiring that the roots don't get destroyed and the roots of the original uh, graph get mapped bijectively to the roots of, of the other graph. So, if the edge weights all come from a coherent algebra and you can find a rooted H minor in G, then that vector space of tensors built on the diagram HR is completely contained in the, ten in the vector space um, of tensors built on the diagram GR prime. The proof is absolutely trivial. The proof is trivial because what, we, what we're saying is that we're deleting and contracting edges. But so of course, if I have an edge in G uh, that I want to contract, I can just choose the weight I, the identity matrix, and that is essentially the same as replacing G by, by, by G with that edge contracted. Likewise, if there's an edge in G that I don't need to build H, then I can just uh, throw the, the edge weight J, the all ones matrix on that edge, and that is essentially the same as deleting that edge. So these vector spaces are, are contained in one another. Now this is really interesting. So here are some spaces that show up in Paul Terwilliger's paper and a couple of things that show up later. Uh, this is in Suzuki's paper. So Paul studied this in 1987 and he uh, introduce some projection operations that project this to here in, and also into here. But this is a subspace of this because I can delete this bottom edge and I can get this graph. Here I can contract this top edge and I can get this graph. So because this is a rooted minor of both of these, that space is a subspace of both of these. Likewise, this is a subspace of this diagram, of, of this vector space up here, because I can, whoops, that the choosing that didn't help, I can contract these three middle edges and get to here. Or I can contract the three outside edges and get from this diagram to here. Here, I can, I can delete the three middle edges and get to here, or I can delete the three outside edges and get to here. And so each of these spaces at this level two here are contained in the spaces at level three. And likewise, you can go up further and further and you notice that each pair horizontally here are circular planar duals of one another. This post set sometimes collapses. And it's kind of interesting to me. And that's all I really want to talk about is when this post set collapses today. Um, so for the Peterson graph, there are no triangles. So P111 is zero. 
Now, to Williger really prove that the dimension of the triangle space is the number of non-zero PIJKs, so the triangle space has dimension 14. All the crime parameters that could be non-zero are non-zero, so the star space has dimension 15. And then you can check how many orbits the automorphism group has on triples, and there are exactly 15 orbits. So the star space is the full space of third order scaffolds. So the, so the triangle space is contained in the star space. And it's easy to prove. Um, I didn't include the proof for a matter of time, but you can find it in the paper. If you have a coherent algebra and either of these two spaces is contained in the other, then this space of K4 minus an edge of second order scaffolds is nothing bigger than the Bose-Messner algebra. So now, since we know that the Schrakonda graph has these two not equal, we know that for the Schrakonda graph, both this space, triangle space, is not contained in the star space, and the star space is not contained in the triangle space. The Terwilliger algebra sort of shows up and emerges in that, in, in that paper in 1987 of Paul Terwilliger, and then he was merciful on us and he, and he sort of deleted the top node and just gave us matrices instead of third order tensors when he wrote about it later. Um, so <clears throat> in, in that paper, you're looking at these third order tensors that are built in this way, in this fan, right? So each of the edge weights comes from the Bose-Messner algebra of an association scheme, and, each, and we have these edges going across and these edges here. And so these scaffolds are kind of interesting. And the Terwilliger algebra, you can just take as the union. Well, these things, this is a, this is a tower. These, this is a chain of uh, subspaces. So therefore, you can just take the union of that chain, and you get the Terwilliger algebra. And now there's a fundamental question. If the Terwilliger algebra is the union of this infinite chain, are there simpler descriptions? Is there some point at which the, the chain stops, at some point at which the chain stabilizes, and that the Terwilliger algebra is equal to just one of these spaces here at the bottom instead of the union of those? And that's what I want to finish with is an example where that happens. Um, so the most basic fans of this type, let's go back here. So here we have a red node at the top. And then we have any uh, a path at the bottom, starting red, ending red, and then just these edges going across. So one possibility is that the path has length one, and um, and we have the the, the uh, triangle. Another possibility that is that the path has length two, and a special case is we put the all ones matrix here and here, and those are the stars. So the stars and triangles are the star space and the triangle space are both subspaces of the Terwilliger algebra. Now. We talked about that inner product earlier where we got a scalar. You, I, I played around with all kinds of crazy products and, um, and I don't have any motivation for them. So I, 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 I should just shut up about that. But one product that's very interesting is the Terwilliger algebra product. So here we take one of those fans in the Terwilliger algebra and we take another one and you can write down precisely what this means. We identify the two top nodes, top root nodes and we keep it red. We identify the rightmost root node in the first diagram with the leftmost root node in the second diagram and make that hollow, and we get another diagram in the same family. So this is the product in the Terwilliger algebra. Now, if you're used to the Terwilliger algebra's matrices, what, what Paul is doing is he's taking vertex by vertex, and instead of looking at the, the, the third order tensor as a three-dimensional box of data, you can think of it as a block diagonal matrix. And this corresponds exactly to just multiplying those block diagonal matrices. Um, there's a definition of a triply regular association scheme or a triply regular strongly regular graph. And in, in the interest of time, I just decided to um, embed the definition in this theorem. So this, the association scheme is triply regular if every K4 diagram, like this one on the right, is a linear combination of triangle diagrams. It's duly triply regular if every one of these um, dual K4 diagrams is a linear combination of these star diagrams. So these are triply regular and duly triply regular. I think um, uh, Jaeger calls it exactly triply regular when both properties hold. And again, here's the space now. 
uh, this this uh, this post set of spaces. And what I want to point out is that in the triply regular case, we're assuming that these two spaces are equal, that there's some collapse in the post set. In the duly triply regular case, we're assuming that these two spaces are equal, so there's some collapse in the post set. So the theorem is, if you have an association scheme with uh, Bose-Messner algebra A, then if it's triply regular, then the Twilliger algebra is exactly the triangle space. And if it's duly triply regular, then the Twilliger algebra is the, um, is the star space. So all of those big, huge fans that show up in the Twilliger algebra can be written as linear combinations of much smaller objects. And the proof, and this is really, um, I should slow down because this is really what I want to convince you of, is that this is a rigorous proof. I really want to convince you that this is a rigorous proof. Okay, so assume that there's a collapse. Uh, let's say that these, um, I call this thing a tri-star, I don't know why, but um, this, uh, assume that this um, space is contained in the space of, of uh, triangles. And now consider a, um, consider anything in the Twilliger algebra with at least two components to the fan, at least two triangles in the fan. We do this inductively, so once we can collapse two, we can collapse three, we can collapse four. So let's just collapse two down to a triangle. So we take the two, and now this node at the top right here, we're going to split that node with the, an identity matrix. And we'll put, um, and we'll put an identity matrix, and, and the two edges weighted B and C will stay on the right, and the edge weighted A will be on the left. Likewise, we're going to split this node E, and we'll keep the edges weighted C and E on the left, and we'll create a new edge here with the identity matrix, and there's nothing else attached to this, this root over here. So this is exactly the same thing by the basic lemmas that we talked about earlier. Our assumption is that each of these configurations is a linear combination of triangles. So this configuration right here, D, B, C, E, I, which I just repeated down here, can be written as a linear combination or a sum of tensors that are just triangles. And now, the basic technical lemmas tell us that we can make a substitution. We can just take that little piece out, and, and we, because the endpoints are, the contact points are all red, we can take the end, that little piece out, and we can substitute this right here. So here we have that, that right here, and we have those, those, uh, that linear combination. So now we substitute these things right into that spot, and now this A becomes a parallel edge, <clears throat> parallel to the T sub J. And because our algebra is closed under edgewise multiplication, of course, that is still uh, a linear combination of triangles. So I propose that we can, we can write down a rigorous theory so that these kinds of manipulations of higher order tensors are completely rigorous and very, very intuitive and natural. And so this is just the, the taste that I wanted to give you. And um, I'm going to just finish by reminding you of some of the basic rules that we have. Thanks for your time. So do we have any questions for Bill? I have a comment. Yes. Hi, Paul. You, hi, Bill. You, you showed us a diagram, a kind of post set, a few slides back. Yeah, yeah, that. There's a, uh, a paper that I, uh, by Supalak Sumel Raj, that talks not exactly about that, but a similar post set. Um, that 
And so it has, has to do with the, what we might think of as the bottom half, the bottom half of your diagram. Uh -huh. um, so the paper I'm talking about is called a diagram associated with the subconstituent algebra of a distance regular graph by hmm. Supalak Sumalraj. Uh -huh. So I'm just giving a plug for a paper that is relevant to your talk subject. And Eric, was that was that what you were showing us, Eric? No, I just wanted to point out that this is a diagram that should look familiar in another context. You know what I'm referring to? I I, I um I oh <laughs> I mean it, that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that well that's a very important diagram, yes. <laughs> Any connect, any comment about why <laughs> it's the same diagram? No, and just I, a coincidence. And I don't know why Thomas and uh, and Pablo have found Lie algebras at attached to these um, these spaces. Um, I, I don't understand um, where that's coming from either. There's, there, there are all sorts of mysterious connections for me. No. Yes. Uh, so oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Whomever it was. Was that you, Paul? Go ahead. I, I, I have another comment, Bill. Yeah. Um, so you you talked about spin models uh, and link, you know, connections to link invariants and what have you. Um, let me mention a, a paper that, or just a, a you know, collection of papers um, that. This kind of reminds me of that might be relevant to what you're doing. So the main author of these papers is Samuel, um, no, I'm sorry, P Peter Samuelson. Peter Samuelson. And um, the papers are about skein algebras, skein algebras, or however you say that, skein algebras for knots and links uh, with connections to the ASCII Wilson algebra. Also, also connected to the double affine Hecke algebra of rank one. So he uh, he's finding Leonard pairs. Um, you know, so we're talking about algebraic version of Q polynomial distance regular graphs, right? He's finding Leonard pairs sort of inside um, or sort of associated with representations of these skein algebras coming from knots and links. Anyway, so I just mentioned uh, the connection. The connection there, yeah. I don't I don't really understand what he's doing, but he's he's talking about Leonard pairs and he's talking about these skine algebras. And his you know he's got these diagrams and the diagrams the you know at least on the surface look look similar to your diagrams. That the the underlying Contact is very different, but um, there, there might be a connection. Mm -hmm. I should mention that uh, there are two new papers of uh, Arnold Neumeyer and uh, and Safet Penjic, which um, which finally bring out the idea of these uh, of these diagrams uh, of, of Neumeyer. Um, in in that case, though, they're all scalars. There there are no no root nodes. Yeah. I think Crystal had a question. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, so in your in your um, last theorem on the second to last slide, uh, you have an equivalent characterization of triply regular schemes. So um, how difficult is it to check that conclusion? Oh, uh, I th I think that that's uh, I, th I think. Do that you have to check the same number of relations as you would normally, like to show that all the PIJK LMNs exist? Yeah, I think I think that this. Um, well, you, you don't have to check that they exist. So, so it turns out that because of the orthogonality of the basis, all you have to do is just check that each of those K four uh, diagrams is in this vector space. You don't have to check that it's a scalar multiple of any one. If it's in this vector space, it must be a scalar multiple of of, of the obvious one. So, so I see. Okay. there's a little bit of a shortcut, but um, but yeah. Uh, I think that um, that this second equation here 
of course, has a lot more information on the surface. And, uh, and, and so I, I certainly wouldn't take that as a shortcut to check, to check the first line. You wouldn't, yeah, so it doesn't save you anything to check the second line instead of the, the first line? No, I, w I, would, I, would take, um, I, I would take this as, as mm -hmm. the shortcut. So all I need to know is that each of these tensors is in this space. I don't need to know what this, I don't, I don't need to know that, that a single scalar exists. I can use inner oh, to show. If, if this tensor is in this space, then it must mm -hmm. be a scalar multiple of the obvious one over here because it's orthogonal to all the others. I see, okay. So, sorry, how many computations do you need to check that a scheme is triply regular? Seven. I, I don't Seven. Know. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine you would need the number of PIJKs squared, but um, I'm sure there's a shortcut. Number okay. of non-zero so, PI case. Yeah, number of non-zero. Yeah, I just wanted to know if it was faster to check this or to check the original definition of triply regular. Yeah, I, I think that 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 verifying that this is that this is a linear combination of some of these is sometimes easier. Okay. But I I, I haven't counted computations. Okay. I, oh, Bill, I I have a historical comment. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned that I attribute um, the scaffold, um, the concept to Neumeier. Let, let me just uh, give you a little, embellish that a little bit. So in 1989, Neumeier visited me in Madison for one year, uh, honorary fellow situation. And um, so, uh, you know, during that year, basically every day, we would have an intense conversation about distance regular graphs and association schemes and what have you. And if the conversation got, uh, you know, technical at all, uh, Arnold would start explaining what he was doing by drawing some diagram. And the diagram, you know, we're talking about a scaffold. He didn't call it that, but um, you know, he had a very elaborate uh, sort of, you know, diagrammatic way of uh, thinking about uh, distance regular graphs. Uh, this, you know, and um, your, your uh, scaffold uh, concept, you know, captured what he was doing. He never uh, wrote anything down formally about it at the, at the time, simply because the uh, typesetting uh, aspect was, <laughs> Oh, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, difficult at that time. So we're talking about 1989. LaTeX tech itself was just just starting to get going at that time. So it basically took a generation before the technology, you know, got to the point where people could, in a reasonable amount of time, you know, actually draw those diagrams. Yeah. So it's still not quite a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's still a, a daunting. Um, Test to, to draw those diagrams, no doubt about it. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm delighted, just delighted. I'm sure Norm, Norm Meyer is also delighted that finally this stuff is showing up in print. Anyway, he gets the credit. Norm Meyer def, definitely gets the credit. <laughs> you get the credit for popularizing and, um, you know, getting the stuff in print. And I, I, I really appreciate that. Bill, Hajime Tanaka has a question in the chat. He says, I remember you conjectured that there is a planar duality in the case of a symmetric association scheme. Do you have any progress on this conjecture? No, I, um, I was sort of alluding to that at, at the beginning. You know, when, I, um, when I've spoken on this topic before, the, the circular planar graphs come up at the end and I rush into that conjecture. And so I decided to define circular planar graphs at the beginning today so that I, I didn't rush it. Um, but I didn't, I didn't mention the conjecture that I believe that any theorem that you can build uh, where the assumptions are, are scaffold equations and the conclusion is a scaffold equation, that the, 
same theorem is true if you if you replace the scaffold equation, the, the, the diagrams by their duals, and the, a, the PIJKs by QIJKs. Just replace A's by E's. And every example I know, if you can write down a theorem that's true in general, then it, it, the dual theorem is also true. But um, I don't have a proof. I'm thinking that you know the medial graph is sort of a halfway point between the uh, the, the circular planar graph and its dual, and um, and and uh, I'd love to find some way to use it, but I don't have any progress on the conjecture. Thanks for asking.